All right. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the fifth and final workshop with Map the System Canada 2024 edition, which is pretty fun. Uh, Map the System Canada is sponsored by ACCO and is in partnership with the Institute for Community Prosperity and the School Centre. My name is Ashley Dion. I am the program lead for Map the System Canada. Map the System Canada is housed at Mount Royal University, which is located on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes the Siksika, Kainai, Kani, Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda Nations. It is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. If you'd like to stay up to date on all things Map the System Canada and build connections with other systems thinkers, consider connecting with us on LinkedIn and Instagram. Today's workshop is about finding the root cause of your systems challenge. And our guest today is Daniela Papithorin. So join me in thanking Daniela for being here today and sharing all her wonderful knowledge with us. And thanks for, uh, you know, creating Map the System as well, Daniela. Um, we're good to get started. I'm going to hand the screen over to you now. Okay, so thank you, Ashley. I'm delighted to be here. Um, my name is Daniela Poppy Thornton. I am going to talk about root causes, but as you can see from the subtitle, I'm going to tell you why I'm skeptical of how we're kind of using that term often. Um, <clears throat> I am going to uh, jump in. There's not a, a you know, there's there's a lot of people signed up. There's a number of people here, but I'm happy since you did show up and you are listening live. If you have questions, if you want to pause and stop me and ask something and ask me to you know, repeat or go back or go forward, tell me, okay? We'll go from there. So first I'm gonna just start with this question. So just take 30 seconds and write in the chat, like why are you here today? I want you to reflect on this. Have you tried solving the wrong problem? So have you ever gone out and you're like, I really, there's something I care about and I'm gonna try and fix it, but actually, I was solving the wrong problem. I was trying to fix the wrong kind of piece of the puzzle, maybe ending up with the opposite results that you wanted or, or not you know, getting as far as you wanted. So I'm gonna give us an example of mine, and then I'm gonna give some other examples. I'm gonna look at what this has to do with kind of this exploration of root cause. Um, okay. <laughs> so I lived in Cambodia for six years and I came to Cambodia with some friends because we decided we were going to bike across Cambodia. My mom was a teacher. My, I believe in education. We're looking for, we're like, let's support education. And so I Googled build a school in Cambodia. And it turns out there was a website, build a school in Cambodia.com. And so wrote to them, raised money, built a building. This is actually the old building that's right across from the new building. And turns out, there was a building there that was half empty. There was our new building with our names on the side that was half empty. There was a health center that was completely empty right behind it with a Belgian guy's name on it. And I realized we were trying to solve the wrong problem. We just had this an assumption. Oh, helping change education? Well, we should build a school, right? We should build this building, right? And I lived in, like I said, I lived in Cambodia for six years and over time we shifted the organization, we shifted what we were doing and we started to invest time in people and we were start, you know, I went there knowing nothing about my own education system, let alone Cambodia's and just made a bunch of assumptions about what this problem was and just acted before I did any time researching, learning, thinking. Right? Later in life, I did a little bit of work um, living in Arusha, Tanzania, and I came across some schools there that had so many kids that they had classrooms sitting outside under a tree, right? And in that case, maybe this building would have been useful, right? They had, the teachers were there, the students were there, right? But in Cambodia, there was this empty building. The teachers weren't being paid, they weren't being paid on time. There was, if they were getting paid, it wasn't enough, so they had to leave during the rice harvest season. There's all this complexity around why education wasn't having the results that they would want to see. And in this particular case, the root cause was definitely not the need of a building, right? So <clears throat> I want to give a, an example here. Some people might have heard of this movement, this effect, um, effective altruism movement, is that correct? Effective altruism movement. And so there was this 
when I was working at Oxford that this, you know, that their book came out, there was a lot of, a lot of um, talk about this. And one of the examples was how to be the most effective with our money. And there's a lot of um, basis on these, these large scale um, research on what, you know, what, how much do things cost? What's working? And there was this argument that for $6 or whatever the amount it is to, to buy some deworming pills, you could have the most impact on changing someone's educational outcomes because it only costs $6 to give the deworming pills and the deworming pills on average give a student X number more days of school. Let's say the number is eight. I don't remember the number. And they have that. And that's the most cost effective way to improve education outcomes, quote unquote. But once again, we need to understand the problem in the context of the place, right? These were these broad studies. And like I said, the, the tiny town that I was in in rural Cambodia happened to not need a school, but the tiny town I was in near Arusha, Tanzania, happened to need a school, right? A lot of kids would have needed deworming pills for $6 and it would have had these other, you know, other impacts on their health indicators, et cetera. But it's not, even if they're showing up to school more days, if their teacher's not, it's not going to improve educational outcomes, right? So we need to both understand what we care about and what we're trying to achieve. And we also need to understand the context in the given spot that we're in. So I want to jump ahead quickly to this idea of, of when we talk about root causes, we start to talk about causality, right? Sometimes we have a symptom of something and sometimes we have a cause of something, right? So there is a whole process, which probably you've seen by now, especially those who are doing map the system stuff, of doing causal loop maps. And I'm showing you one here, my colleague, Jennifer Menke, who I teach with at CU Boulder. <clears throat> this is a map. She worked with a lot of people in the Osa Peninsula to map things that are happening in their community. Now, as you can see, this is complex, right? This is a very complex map. And actually, if someone just emailed this to you and you could like zoom in to every little component here, even with that, you know, even with hours, you probably aren't going to understand it unless you have someone interpreting it for you and walking you through it, right? And so in my mind, we have this a bit of a kind of <clears throat> obsession with the artifact right now, this artifact of a systems map, the artifact of causal loop maps, right? And it's such an obsession that in some places and some nonprofits, some government bodies, et cetera, we are, they're paying these external people saying, well, you map our system for us because we know that this is a thing. People are talking about mapping systems. We don't know how to do it. And so can we pay you to do it, right? So all of you who are learning how to do this right now, this is actually a skill that people will pay you to do, right? The problem is you want to do this with someone like Jennifer Menke here who did this, who works with communities to do the research and self map, right? What you don't want to do is outsource this. And I've had situations where I've got a call and said, we just paid six figures to have this map done. And we don't know why we did that, right? But it's like, now have this thing and maybe you have some notes that explain it. But it's not about making the map. It's actually about the process and the research and the learning that comes out, right? It's not like, tell me what the root causes are. Tell me what the causality is. It's because there isn't in these complex systems a answer that is correct. It's about the learning and the journey and the research. And then you harvest out of that some insights, right? And if you just get given the quote unquote insights, you miss out on the real learning. So I just want to highlight that piece. Kumu, which is the software that Jennifer used to make that <clears throat> what that uh, causal loop map that you just saw, is one of the many mapping softwares, probably the most uh, popular among the people that I know. And this Ryan here, the founder of Kumu, says this: "We're no longer modeling systems; we're telling stories about systems to humans." And I think that this is an important piece too. Systems dynamics, systems mapping, these are not new things. These have been ha going on, happening for a long time, right? I have this Yodo player, my child's electronics, my version of a, you know, I had books on tape. 
he has this thing, he sticks cards in, listens to music, right? So someone who makes, who made this, the Yodo company, hi Yodo company, probably someone somewhere has like a map of every component in this, every single piece, right? And I can't figure out how to fix this thing, but somebody can, right? They know, and they are gonna, there is a cause, right? And it might be like, okay, man, oh, this, you, here you can see here, this button fell off, right? This, this piece is not connected, right? And we can fix that. And then the system works again, right? Because this, if, if we just took this all apart, it's just a heap, right? The system is when you put all these things together and it creates something more than the sum of its parts, right? So now the root cause might be, you're not maintaining it well. Your son is throwing it against the wall. Someone is dropping it in the water, right? Like the root cause of that problem, but, but might be something deeper than this button has fallen off, right? But it's possible to map this out. So systems dynamics, systems mapping in those ways are not new, right? The newish thing is that in the last decade, we started to take that terminology, take that way of thinking, take those skills, take these kind of mapping softwares and use it on these complex social environmental systems, not to map for completion, right? If you're trying to map all the parts in this, you better get them all right. You are never gonna get all the parts of poverty. You're never gonna get all the parts of, you know, homelessness and, and the mental health. And there's, there's no way it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It is a made up thing. An alien flies over to look at the world and they cannot see the education system. There is no such thing as the education system. There's no boundary on the education system. Does our healthcare system incl is included in the education system? Is mental health stuff included, right? Where, where is the bounds of it? It doesn't exist. It is a mental model. It is something we made up in our head, right? This exists and there's a finite number of parts, right? Okay, so we're using this terminology, this way of working, these tools that we used to use for these like more concrete, uh, complicated things that are finite. And now we're bringing them into this like infinitely endless systems in these social environmental systems. But we're still using the same terminology, right? And this is where I have this challenge with how we sometimes think about this term of root cause. So we'll get to that. But here, Ryan says, we're no longer modeling systems. We're telling stories about systems to humans, right? And so he gives an example. This is from a Medium article that I think I linked at the bottom here. Yeah, <clears throat> that... And this is his, you know, he's telling this story. And, and instead of just showing you the loops, he's giving you some sentences to tell the story. Now, when we're back here with Jennifer's map, Jennifer also has those stories and she's using it to tell those stories, right? Because she was part of that process and all the community now owns that process and can tell those stories. And they're telling those stories to themselves to make better decisions. Look at our insight, look what we're learning. And they're telling their stories to the outside world to say, here is what's happening. You don't, you know, you don't need to understand this complex thing, this math, but here is the insights, right? And that's the value that we can bring is that process. Okay. So let's go to one more. Have you tried to solve a wrong problem? So I, I, I took a coaching class with Richard Strozzi, the founder of the Strozzi Institute a number of years ago. And they gave this, they gave this example where they say, imagine there's this, there's this woman, and I think it was a, you know, based on a real story, where a woman who comes to her coach and she's like, I need to work on my public speaking. It is not working. Like I, I am like giving, I'm sharing my insights. Nobody is taking any action from it. It's not landing. People are, I need to learn public speaking, right? So, you know, if that was you, maybe you would sign up for like Toastmasters course on like speaking. You might like get a public speaking coach, take it on a class, whatever it is, right? <laughs> so it does all this work. And eventually your coach is like asking more questions. She's like, this is not working. I'm still like, I'm a better public speaker, but it's still not working. And, and finds out, okay, you know, she's the only woman on the team. She's the only young, you know, person under the age of 45 on the team, right? And so there's these components of the system that might be a bigger cause than her public speaking skills as to why her messages are not getting heard and other people's are, okay? 
And and Stroza uses this uh, this mapping, uh, which was originally developed by Alan Gregg, and I asked them if I could use this um, previously. And this, I, I really like, uh, you know, I was looking at this concept of here's the sites of shaping and the sites of change. So we are shaped from all these different, um, you know, the lenses that we might look at. And this is also the areas where we can create change. And if you look, I, this is from a Medium article about human-centered design really similar, right? Like these are, like we are shaped, like a, a big problem impacts at all these levels and can also be impacted and changed at all these levels, right? Okay. I bring this up because we're starting, we're having, we took this terminology of root cause, right? From these like way of working that was about using finite systems. We moved it into these systems, no longer finite systems. We're still using the terminology root cause, right? But it's confusing because there isn't, like, you can look, there's gonna be causes at all these levels and impacts at all these levels. And I often have students say, where's the root, right? As if there's an answer, one answer. And once again, the value is in the process, in the analysis, because you might wanna work at any one of these levels and all of them are fine, you know? You might want to do the code, the public speaking class, or you might want to work on changing the configuration of that board of that team. And you know, you'll you'll as you go through this, you're going to think about which ones, which leverage points, which opportunities to create change are going to create more outsized results. So, I want to just give a plug to this article that just came out, like here February 12th. So it just came out a few weeks ago by Laura Calderon de la Barca, Catherine Milligan, John Cania. They work together at the Collective Change Lab. This is a must read article. And it is talking about healing systems. Let's read the subtitle. How recognizing trauma in ourselves, other people, and the system around us can open up new pathways to solving social problems. And, and it, if you read this article, which I highly recommend, it's one of the one of the findings is that the more trauma in the system, the more resistance to change it is. Because actually, we cannot look at these really really traumatic systems. Like I did some work last year with in the migration system in the UK, right? So you have the trauma of people going through a migration system. You have the trauma of the people working in the migration system. You have the fact that a lot of the people working in the migration system also went through the system, right? So they are getting re-traumatized every time they have to deal with someone's heartbreaking stories, right? And those systems, if we can't, the trauma only exists in us as humans. Once again, the alien flies through, I don't see trauma, where's trauma? What's Trump? You know, they see incidents and things that are, you know, like blockages and 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 you know, but the trauma is held in us, right? So these are these are ways, all these levels that we can look at a problem. Okay, so highly recommend that. And they're doing a lot of interesting work. So back to root causes. Okay. So we had the this woman, right? So at first she's saying public speaking, <clears throat> right? And now we have um this other way of looking at, okay, the team, the formation of this team that she's working on. But always when I'm working with my students, as we can know, someone eventually is like, it's the patriarchy, or someone else is like, no, it's capitalism, right? The deeper we go on any of these issues, we're gonna find these things that we might say are the root. And you could even keep, you could keep going, right? But you could say there's these roots, for example, one root that is in so many problems that you are maybe looking at is short-term thinking, right? Well, we could change this if the policymakers were willing to fight for it, but these, but but it's not going to be so popular, and they get reelected in two years, and so they're not going to fight. They want to do a short-term thing, even though we know those aren't, you know, aren't going to create these changes, right? So that's that is the case all the time with the issue of the unhoused. Is the case. Um, with so many of these problems, definitely with the migration crisis, like we're going to look 
fierce. We're going to do something. It looks like we're tackling this problem before the election, right? Those might, those are some of the quote unquote root causes, but it is totally up to us where we want to work. Yes, somebody should work on short-term thinking, but you're, you might be working on this problem of the unhoused in your community. And you're like, I don't want to spend the next 30 to 50 years of my life trying to change how our voting system works, how often people get voted on, how we, ele you know, how we elect. I actually want to work on this thing, <clears throat> right? And so there, so this terminology to me of root cause can be damaging. We need to still do these processes, but we don't do it in trying to find the answer, the root cause, right? We're doing it to understand, wow, the complexity. This is impacting it and that is impacting it, right? And, and then we get to, to think about where we want to intervene. I might skip. Oh, I'll do it really quick. So when I used to work at Oxford Society Business School, I was in a business school, right? So when I'm working with students, I would constantly be like, take your solution, hang it up over there, take a breath. Let's do a little more understanding of the problem. And once a year, I would do this lecture, this class at, at Goldsmiths, which is one of the more liberal of universities in, in London. And inevitably, someone in the class would be like, but why do we even have to have money? <laughs> you know, where we need to get to the like, there's these deeper, bigger, these, you know, capitalism, patriarchy, all this stuff. And how are we going to solve this? And so for them, I'd sometimes be like, go to a hackathon. <laughs> you know, let's like, you know, we need to find the balance, right? And I co authored a book called Learning Service, and we based it on one definition of the Vajra, which is this Mahayana Buddhist symbol, which is this figure eight and you know kind of a 3d version of a figure eight and one one version of that is action without learning is ignorance learning without action is selfishness right we need this balance this can be mapped to completion every single part your system complex social environmental system whatever it is cannot right so if you feel like you're the type of person who's like, I don't know enough. I still don't know enough. I still don't know enough. I've been working on this for four months, every single day for 12 hours a day. I still don't know enough. Go to a hackathon. You know, it's okay. Say, I am done for now. I'm going to start to synthesize, analyze. I'm going to start to pull out root causes. There will always be rabbit holes that you could go down further, right? And we're never going to map it all. It's not the point you can't, right? But if you're someone who's like day three is like, I already know the answer. Here, we're going to, I know how to solve this complex challenge that people haven't solved for decades hang your solution on the wall and do some more research right right so we're looking the act of looking for these root causes is the act of learning more okay so if we look at, at this example we can see how it you it it overlays this is an from also from john Kenya. so john Kenya and that healing article used to be the Head of FSG. This is a report from FSG called "The Waters of Systems Change," and this is um, this idea of the six conditions of change. So, you know, in here we're saying there's these deep problems: capitalism, patriarchy, right? There's this tough challenge. Public speaking, right? She's worked on that, so it doesn't seem to have changed anything. In the middle, we have this team formation, right? So here they're talking about the depth too. At the bottom, we have mental models. Imagine whatever challenge it is that you're trying to look at. Imagine if every single person in your in that area, every single voter, every single politician, every single person in the system believed that that was the most important challenge in the world right now. Whatever it is that you're looking at, some some environmental challenge you might be looking at, uh, the unhoused, you might, in mental health, what, whatever it is that you're working on. Imagine if everybody who was voting or making decisions was like, this is the most important thing. Right. If that was the case, whoops. Um, if that was the case, um, that it would be changed. The problem would be changed, right? Because every voter would vote towards that. Every politic, all these other things, power dynamics, connections, relationships, policy, practice, would all change, right? Mental models, super deep leverage point, and we'll talk about Danella Meadows' view of that in a second. Deep leverage points mean it's transformative. It's going to change everything else. 
But changing someone's mind, have you ever tried to change someone's mind? <laughs> have you ever tried to change your own mind? Hardest thing in the world. Way easier to change a policy. And a policy is still hard to change, right? Policies you can't change overnight. Mental models you can't change in a decade, right? Yes, these are some root causes, but they might or might not be where you decide to intervene based on the timeline, based on any other number of things, right? So this six condition frameworks has mental models, then relationships, power dynamics. We'll get to those in a second. We'll go up to the top. Policies, practices, resource flows, the structural components of a system. That's often what we think about. We think about a system. Okay, what are the policies? How are people operating? Who has the money or the resources, the knowledge? Where does it go, right? These top things could just kind of be listed out. The middle things are what make it a system, really. It's like can, what connects it, right? You could have just a list of actors. These are all the actors who are working on the mental health challenge in our community, right? But it's the power dynamics and the relationships between them, right? And in some ways that the trauma that's held in there that we just talked about, it, right? That these people won't talk to those people and these people don't trust these people and da 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 right? Because it comes from past traumas, right? That's what makes the system work, not work, stagnate, whatever, all these things, right? And then the mental models are that, that like kind of embedded view of that trauma, of that, of those things like, oh, I don't, I, I don't trust these people. I do trust that. Here's what I think about these people. This is, what, this is my view of mental health in general, right? So we can use these to think of like the depths of the causes. They're all causes. These can be our leverage points, but these can also be the causes, right? So you could use a tool like this to map out some of your root causes. You could also use a tool like this to map out your potential leverage points and map it against these, right? And this is in the slide deck, just, but you'll look it up in, in uh, this conditions of system change, the water of system change paper, but this is just their definition of each of these components. Okay, so warning again, there isn't, likely isn't a root cause. There isn't a root cause, right? There's lots and lots of causes at lots of lots of levels, lots and lots of depths. So it isn't about finding the answer. It is about the process so that you can reveal where you might want to contribute. And that contribution is not going to be based on the right answer, the depth. It's going to be a combination of what, where the leverage points are, and then where do we want to intervene? What is our timeline? Do we're like, we know nothing about policies. We don't want to deal with policies. That's a big, like it's a big problem with the policy, but that's not for us. Great, there's going to be so many other components and ways to intervene. You don't have to, it's not like finding the one, right? I love this quote that says, um, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and then go out and do that because what the world needs is people who come alive, right? Same sort of thing. Don't go be a doctor because you're someone told you to be a doctor and you hate blood, right? It's not like there is this hierarchy where they're like, that's the thing to do to help. No, there's a million ways to help. Same thing with your system. There's a million ways to intervene. There's different levels of depth. Someone needs to work on the patriarchy and you know capitalism, fine. But that might not be you. You might be like, we're going to do the public speaking or I'm going to do the, the dynamic, you know, the, the team. I'm gonna, we're going to work on this short term policy change re regarding the people who are unhoused in our community because we want to make change now. We're going to work or you're going to say we're going to work on a 20, 30 year mental model change about how we think about housing and who deserves it and how they can get it and da, 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 or just changing structures in the middle. OK, little plug. Uh, James Stotch and I and Anna Johnson are. We wrote a student guide for mapping a system. So hopefully you've had access to that or anyone who's working on map the system and you can get that online. Um, we're working with, with ACO sponsorship as well to redo this and it's uh, in a way that's accessible to practitioners. And it's called right now the 55 minutes and it's based on this quote that's often attributed to Einstein, which is, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I would spend the first 55 minutes thinking about the problem and the last five minutes thinking about the solution, right? So this is, and you can see in the subtitle, a guide to solving problems and changing systems, but edited, a pre-innovation guide. So before innovation, or sometimes people come to it during innovation, to not solving problems. We can't solve 
these problems in our lifetime, these super complex problems, reframing them, understanding them, look at different, like where are the intervention points? And by reframing them and understanding the problem and the different, like lots and lots of causes at different levels, now we can find out how to contribute to changing the system because we can't do it by ourselves, but we can contribute to, right? So this act of looking at quote unquote root causes, I would say is an act of reframing a problem, right? So reframing it from it's a public speaking problem to it's a structural problem in our, in how, you know, how our teams are formed. Um, reframing figures out different ways, helps you figure out different ways to contribute to change. <clears throat> but wait, you're saying you can't solve problems? Wait, hold on, wait. No, we can't. But there's different types of problems. We'll do this super quick. Karl Popper, who was alive during like all of the 1900s, I think he was born in 1902 and, and, and died in 1994, something like that. Early part of his career, he did a lot of talking about this idea of clock problems versus cloud problems. Clock problem, right? Clock is broken. It can be fixed. Cloud problem. We don't walk outside and it's raining and it happens to be our wedding day or a big picnic we're supposed to have and we're not like, it's broken. Somebody fix the clouds, right? No, right? I live in Colorado where we say, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes, right? Because it's always changing, right? And we don't view it as something to be broken or something that can be fixed. Well, we used to not view it as something can be fixed. And this is a side note. You can look up ABC News, weather modification, Colorado River, and this five minute video will show you how here in Colorado and a lot of states, we are putting chemicals into the clouds to get more water out so we can get more snow for our ski resorts, right? So we are, we are using this like linear mindset thinking, well, the clouds are broken. We could, we could fix it. We can get more water out of there. We can get more snow out of there. I'm just gonna put some chemicals in the clouds. That'll be fine, right? This is from an article, media, another medium piece, Robert Sigliano, who does a lot of amazing systems, teaching and system work, works at the Midyear Network. He wrote this piece, and this is his kind of interpretation of Karl Popper's work. Clock problems, predictable, controllable, bounded, cloud problems, unpredictable, hard to control, and this end of evolving. And he puts this quote in. Oh, this is the article. It's called The Complexity Spectrum. This is the quote he puts in. We shouldn't try to fix what needs healing or heal that which can be fixed, okay? We shouldn't try to fix when he's healing. So we can fix the clock, but we're gonna get in big trouble, I think, with this view that we can fix the clouds, right? I skipped over this one, my phone, right? When I take it in to the Genius Bar, because I think it's not working, they don't say to me, Daniela, how's your relationship, you know? because it is not impacting my phone unless someone threw it at someone, right? <clears throat> it is bounded. It is a clock problem. Now, if I try to, and trust me, I've tried to fix my child, right? Because I'm like, oh no, I need to fix you. I, I can't believe you got in this fight or you're, you're in a bad mood or whatever, right? It will not work, right? It's good. Like I, the, and I also can't figure out what is the root cause of this? Oh, when you were six months old, I didn't teach you this one thing. And that's why you're being grumpy today. No. Right, it's a cloud, right? Same thing, it says, you know, here in Colorado, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. If you're raising a child, you know, like, oh my gosh, whatever's going on for me and my kid right now, it's so huge. And then like three months later, you have tea with that same friend. And it's like, so, that is totally gone. Is there something new, right? Like it is constantly changing and it's evolving. And you can't open up your book and say, today I'm gonna teach you this and fix you in this way. No, I'm gonna, whatever comes up, I'm gonna, meet you there, whatever emerges. And I'm going to like meet you there and help you with whatever that is there, right? Because it's unpredictable. It's endless. It's evolving, right? Clouds. I've been concerned with how we're dealing with these clouds and thinking we can fix this, right? These are unpredictable problems. Okay. And so I'm just going to touch, you probably know these as other typology frameworks. The Kinefin model. Yes, it doesn't look like it's pronounced that way. It is a Welch word. Welsh word, the only Welsh word I can probably pronounce if I'm pronouncing it right. Sorry, David Snowden. So it's not model, sorry. Kinefin framework. David is very clear. It's Kinefin framework that, and he looks at complexity, complicated, clear. These are different ways to look at the typology of your problem. And this is the Stacy matrix, Ralph Stacy's matrix, similar thing. All of these have this zone of complexity. And that's what we're talking about. 
these complex challenges, okay? And in these complex challenges, we're still using the same terminology that we used to use in the simple and complicated ones, but we have to remember, it's we're talking about a different zone, a different type of problem, right? We can fix the clock, we can't fix the clock. And we are reminded not to. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll give you a quick second to think, like write it down for yourself, like what, one sentence, what is the problem <clears throat> that I'm trying to explore? Because we're gonna kind of do a little causes thing on this. So I want you to take 30 seconds in one, one sentence, write down the problem that you are trying to explore, okay? So um, we'll do that. <laughs> um, I should have put a little sign. Okay. Um, okay. Read your sentence to yourself before we go into this other this next activity, and make sure it's not a solution in disguise, right? So this is from the student guide to mapping a system. If you wrote something like <clears throat> getting clean hand washing stations into schools, that is a solution in disguise, right? You're saying. I have assumed that whatever problem it is that I'm trying to solve, I have assumed that getting clean hand washing stations into it is going to be the solution. So I believe my problem is getting this hand, stop, hand washing stations in there, right? Actually, you probably have some belief that like there is illnesses and the hand washing stations are going to solve it. And you don't really care about the hand washing stations. You care about the illnesses, right? And you have an assumption that the hand washing stations is the way to do that, but it might or might not be, right? And so actually you wanna write down the problem in the frame of like what you really wanna change, right? We have wells that have been dug all across the world. So if your problem was we need to dig more wells, you have succeeded, right? Most of those wells do not work. And if they do, often they are, you know, water that is coming out of it is not potable, right? It needs to be filtered. It needs to be, it can actually make people more sick, right? In Cambodia, the deeper you drill your well, the more likely you are to pull arsenic out because it's the deep wells actually are where you're going to get the arsenic, right? So now you've caused more of a problem, right? Because we're just, it's not about the wells. It was about clean water access, right? Clean water access is a way more complex challenge than digging wells. Getting clean hand washing stations, way easier to do. We can check off. We've built 54 of them. We've done 176. We've done 2,542. If you're job, if you're truly trying to stop the spread of illnesses, you're not going to do that just through this, you know, this one thing, right? So this is where we want to think about our challenge. Just that helps us think more about the root causes, right? Because we've had to reframe away from this solution mindset. Um, I'd like to look at this, this Ansel Adams piece. Um, just quote, it says, you don't take a picture, you make a picture. Ansel Adams, famous photographer, right? He doesn't make these mountains. He literally just picks the boundaries, right? That is his entire job, right? He has to have a good camera and focus and I'm sure there's more to it. <laughs> Any photographer out there is like, there's a lot, of course there is, right? But maybe like one of the skill set really is in that he brings is deciding where those boundaries are, right? And so where do I really want to focus? Where do I want to focus when I look, think about these root causes things, right? It's about where do you want to put those bounds? So ask yourself this three times. So we're going to do, there's something called the five whys. I believe it was created by part of Toyota's Kaizen system. Toyota is known for this way of working that they were, you know, everyone was, at the time, building cars with these big factories, and they had this system of like, how do we get information to be able to like up from those who have the most knowledge to quickly iterate and quickly change, right? And part of that is to identify root causes. Like, we can keep replacing this machine, but if the problem is like how we're using it or how we're training people to use it or whatever, why are we replacing this machine all the time? We should be changing our training or we should be changing the type of paper we put into it or whatever. Okay, so. This model, and they use this asking five whys, and five is just happens to be the number they think is like a good amount, but you could go 12, you could go three, whatever you wanna do. We're just gonna go three, 
And normally I have people do three sets of three Y's. There's going to be two other questions. And I'm not going to have you do question two and three today, but I will introduce them at the end, just so you know what those are. And we're just going to do question one today. So if you have a sheet of paper, you can draw out, you know, six boxes, even nine boxes here, or you could just draw the three, or you can just have a sheet of paper, or you can do this in your brain. But it's probably easier if you write it down. And I want to ask you, with the challenge that you've just written down, this problem sentence that you wrote, Okay, so you wrote your one sentence. Here's the problem I care about. I want you to read that sentence and then take a second and say, why is this happening? And I want you to write down one sentence or a couple words or a couple sentences, but not 20 sentences. What's the first thing that comes to mind? What's the first thing you're thinking about? Why is this happening? <clears throat> and after you've written that sentence, I want you to read that sentence again. So I started with my problem. I've written my sentence. Here's why I think it's happening. First thing that came to mind. Now I'm reading that sentence and I want to say, why is that happening? Okay, so I'm writing a second sentence down of why that first sentence is happening. And I'm doing that three times. Okay, so I'm going to give you another like 30 seconds and you can work on this afterward too. Um, because I know a lot of people are going to be watching this afterward online and they can just pause and give themselves a few minutes. Okay, so if you've given yourself the time, which I know I've expedited us here, but just you've written down, here's my problem. Here's why I think it's happening. Oh, here's why I think that's happening. Okay. And then eventually I want you to share this. So if you're on a team of any sort, if you're doing this throughout the system, if you're you know, just working on a real problem out in the world, right now and you I want you to do this like three or four of you or however many of you do this silently by yourself and then bring it together right and and it, it'll be interesting to see like what rabbit holes did people go down of where they they think the problem is right so you might have started with some sort of problem and someone is like well it actually relates to how we do child care but actually that relates to this health care piece and someone else is going down like this, you know, something related to jobs and how we train parents or money or capitalism or mental health, right? And we've, we've gone down different rabbit holes of why that's happening, all starting with that same first sentence, whatever your first sentence happened to be, right? So you're starting to kind of map out in some way the different overlapping systems. And once again, systems are all made up in our head anyway, right? The boundaries of them. Um, and you're starting to see where people view the problems. Now, by doing this, hopefully if, every, if everyone has slightly different views, you can see why, wow, it's really important when I'm looking at a problem that I get different views, right? Because someone who has a legal background, they might really understand this is a policy problem and then this is how we change policy problem. And this is like, you know, or maybe our justice system problem or, you know, whatever. And somebody who has the lived experience of the issue might say, here are the barriers that I came across. Like, and here are the mental models that other people have that seem to be like, you know, impacting how they engage with me or da, 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 right? And you can see that actually these different perspectives will start to form your understanding of that challenge in different ways. And some of you might start to look at these different leverage points. So this is Danella Meadows' work. Danella Meadows studied at MIT. She taught at Dartmouth, um, was a, written a number of books about systems that are, um, yeah, very famous and, ex and accessible in some ways. Some people think they're more accessible than others. But anyway, um, you, can, you can search Danella Meadows' leverage points, and there's an article, which I believe is just an excerpt from, her, excerpt from her book, and it talks about her view of kind of these depths of leverage points, right? And so this is, we don't, right, we don't have time to get fully into leverage points today, but these leverage points map onto root causes, right? The rules of a system, if the rules of a system are holding a certain system in place, that is a root cause and it's also a pos an area of leverage, right? And then, um, you know, the structures and the networks, et cetera, those are higher up in her model and, and probably can be changed in a quicker way than some of these like deeper pieces and, and you know, gonna have maybe a little bit of less impact, right? So another way, some of my students, when they're working on these things, might map their leverage points or their root causes against Danella Meadows' model. Another way to look at this. Okay. 
And I just want to talk about this is an example. I teach a class at Dartmouth with Catherine Milligan, who was one of the co-authors again on that on that healing systems uh, SSIR piece, Stanford Social Innovation Review piece. And she always uses this example. Thank you, Catherine. Um, of uh, com community solutions so new in New York. So community solutions started out looking at the issue of the unhoused in New York City. We need more houses. There's a lot of people on the street. We need more places. So over a few decades, they bought, leased, rented, whatever, all these buildings <laughs> that you see here. They bought they, all these you know spaces in all these buildings to kind of help people transition into, into homes. And then they look back and they say, how's it going? Oh, this problem is worse than when we started. Like what is going on? We chose this particular leverage point, this, you know, this housing piece, right? And then they started asking these questions that, like that you all are doing about your issues, right? What is happening in the system? What is, what is going on, right? And they started going down multiple different rabbit holes, not just this housing piece, right? So they had like, there is not enough housing. They'd gone down that and they was like, we're gonna fix it, right? And now they're like, there's all these pieces. And one of the heuristics that people talk about often with systems is they say, get the system in the room and let the system see itself. So they did that. They got the system in the room and they helped the system see itself. They got all these different organizations, tons and tons of organizations, as you can imagine in New York, that are somehow dealing with this issue. And then they, one of the things they started to map out, there's a visual of like all the steps someone would need to take to go from living on the street into one of these houses. And there's like, dozens of steps right but even just helping getting the system in the room helping the system see itself they were able to actually just in that meeting cancel out some steps oh you do that we do that we don't need to both do that we can share that oh you do this we can do that like actually why do we even need this step like did, you know so the, the then they started they go on a totally different path now um they talk about solving problems and i think some of you know there can be a, a there's healing that's certainly needed in this system, but they do an, a process that is not about buying buildings and getting people getting more houses anymore. They do the process of how do we get the people in the room and kind of start to understand the system so we can make shifts so that we can have this longer term view of how to how to not have this problem into the deep into the future. Okay, so then they once again you can map it map all those things on here they're starting they're looking at policies right they're not just looking at resource flows who has access to buildings anymore right they're looking at the connection the relationship do these organizations speak who has the power you know back up who has the money what are the practices how often do they share information right what are the policies governing this mental models how do they even like within the system how do we think about ourselves in the system do we think about ourselves as solving it do we think about ourselves as actors in a team you know contributing right Okay, but I really want to map my root causes, Daniela. This is why I took this workshop. I did not want you to talk to me. I want you to give me tools. Okay, I hear you. Thank you for saying that. This used to be the tool that I would give students. You can see I have changed my song. This used to be what I would hand out, right? So it's like challenge, symptoms, take those whys and why, you know. And it's useful to just think about, you can do this. Go, do it, you know that there are so many directions you can take your whys, but it's also a little prescriptive, right? You can use this type of tool, Google, super easy, Fishbone, Ishikawa diagram. You can find a ton of these online. And what these are, are like, so once again, a lot of this comes from mapping this type of system, right? But you know, here it's like, you have an oil spill. Okay, what happened in the oil spill? What happened in, like our repair and maintenance process, what happened in the actual materials, like what happened with the weather, what happened, you know, you're mapping all these things. But in your case, it's probably going to be things like, let's look at the legal system in relation to this. Let's look at the mental models, right? You could take any of those, those policy practices, you can put those in here. You can look at different, like if your problem is at the intersection of many different systems, healthcare, education, blah, 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 you might look at, you might those might be your titles you choose when you're starting to look at the different 
causal components that are leading towards this problem, right? This is another tool to use. You can use any of these tools, right? You can use this kind of tool. You can use this kind of tool. You can use this kind of tool. You can use Danella's tool, right? But it's not about the end product, right? It's about like these, about this. So this is where I, I think the key thing is like, you are trying to look at this problem through multiple lenses. And each of these lenses is going to have different root causes that they believe are the causes because they only see through their lens, right? So the people you know, living in, let's say Boulder, Colorado, where I live, the mayor is gonna have a view. And the mayor happens to live in my community and the mayor needs to get reelected at some point, right? The mayor has a view. The mayor's getting a lot of pressure. The mayor's getting a lot of messages and emails. He's getting, there's a lot of pressure politically, voters, et cetera. Right, and who else, you know, we have um, the people with lived experience, right, who have their view, which we, already, we just, we talked about that. We have the school principal, the, a policy coming up in Colorado, which is, you know, saying that like, if you're, if there's people who are on house can't live a certain distance from a school, there's schools everywhere, right? So the principal might have a certain view on this and they might also have different view on like how the people are being removed and is this ethical and what's happening, right? So like. We're talking about, talk, you need to talk to all these people. Someone who works in a shelter might have certain certain views, right? On what these root causes are. And after you've looked at this from so many lenses, you might start to see some themes. You might start to say, okay, there's this, there's a mental health component. We talked about that short-term incentives, right? It's gonna be across a lot of things, right? These are different depths, right? We might talk about at that highest level, right? Oh, we just, a lot of people are saying, oh, we just need more temporary help. How do we make a better house for a short term, right? No problem working there. But it's, all, it's, you know, it's at that level, same level of working on the public speaking, right? It's going to be, it's going to have a certain impact, but it's not going to change the dynamics of the system, right? And that's fine. You get to choose where we want to work as long as we're actively choosing that. You might go all the way, capitalism, right? Okay, so the value of this, once again, it's the process, but it's also, it's, you're not just trying to map it so that you can say something that is clear to everyone already, right? You're trying to unveil like, yeah, here's where everyone's working. And of course these are causes, but there's these other causes at different depths that might be overlooked, right? And in order to do that, you need to look at causes, but you also need to look at what's already happening. So this is a, the impact gaps canvas, a super basic tool I made. I always say it's common sense, but not common practice. Common sense that you'd wanna understand what's happening, but you'd also wanna understand who's already trying to solve this. What are they doing? Where are they working, right? So when you overlay these together and say, look, I'm doing my mapping of root cause dynamics, right? Like I did super basic here about the problem of the unhoused. It's not a problem I know a ton about, right? But if you start to dig into it in your community, you're going to start to get a lot more specific and understanding about what policies. And maybe, you know, like the, the school building wasn't what was needed in Cambodia, but it was in Arusha, Tanzania. You know, it might be in your town that there is a shortage of actual need for buildings. And in New York City, that wasn't the, that wasn't the depth that they wanted to work on, right? So you're starting to look at what's happening, what's causing things, but then also what's being tried and then revealing possibilities for contributions, right? Okay, so I'm gonna give you these last two questions that I would use and then I'm gonna wrap and if there's any minutes left, we can have time for questions. I don't know where we're at. How many minutes are left? <laughs> We've got five minutes left. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, go team. Okay, so we did our first question already, right? Why is this happening? Why, why, why? And we're starting to reveal like, our lenses on this. Second question I would ask is why do you care about this? Okay, and you'd write that down. Here's why I care about this. Is I care about this because there's a guy who looks cold at the end of my road, right? Like, why do I care about that? And why do I care about that, right? And as you do that, you start to reveal your own values, your motivation, your interests. So, for example, I had a group of students who cared about green spaces in urban areas, okay? Green spaces in urban areas. One of them cared about it because they cared deeply about mental health. And they knew 
that there's tons of studies that say the more that we connect to nature, the better our mental health is, right? And so they want everyone to have access even in urban areas to more green spaces. And someone else on the team said, they care about this because they care about racial equity, racial justice. There is, you know, in, in many cities, you can map out green space access ver versus, uh, you know, racial density populations or, or economic, pop, you know, air density versus green spaces, right? So for them, it was an equity issue, right? And a third person might be on this problem because they're like in the, you know, in Calgary, let's say, and they're like, I care about it for my kids to have access to green spaces in Calgary, right? So they all start working together on some initiative in Calgary, let's say. And then down the line, a few months down the line, a few years down the line, one of them says, okay, let's take on some other racial equity issues. And someone went, racial equity is no, no, let's take on some other mental health stuff. So I was like, what are you talking about? I care about Calgary green spaces, right? So this is an important question to dig into, to understand your values, to understand your motivations. It's fine to have different motivations on the team, but you want those aired and expressed and understood as you move forward. Right. And finally, the last question, if we were working on a team that was already doing this, right? So if you're working on a team that's really in this, the question is, why haven't we solved this yet? Yes, I use the word solved and I'm not talking about solving these types of challenges necessarily, but it's the colloquial term. Why haven't we solved it yet? Right? So I'd say, here's why. Well, why haven't we solved that? Let's do that three times. If you're already working on it, what you're starting to do is map your internal system of your organization. We haven't solved it because the leadership doesn't care about it. Why don't they care about it? Well, we haven't told, we haven't explained it enough to them. They don't actually even really understand the problem or there's no budget for it. Why is there no budget? There's no incentive. You know, our, our, our bonus structure doesn't include it. Our incentive, no one's tracking it. There's no one managing it. No one's responsible for it. It's not in our KPIs, whatever, right? And you're starting to map your internal system and the barriers that you have internally to change this. Good. Yeah. Thanks everyone for, for joining and thanks Daniela for sharing your knowledge. Uh, it's very much so appreciated. And yeah, we look forward to working with you in the future as well. I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great afternoon or whatever time it is for you. Ciao. Thanks everyone.